my advice to producers when they um, call me and say they suspect that maybe there's some ergot in their diets, number one, we always tell them to get it tested. And of course, that comes with all the other issues of testing for mycotoxin sampling and everything that um, that's a uh, that's always an issue with mycotoxins is the sampling aspects. But if they feel that they, they, they do want to buy this grain and use it um, to not feed it to their sows, keep it out of their sow herd. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Columbus, your host for today's Swine Knit Canada podcast. And today uh, our guest is Dr. Denise Bolio who is an assistant professor of monogastric nutrition at the University of Saskatchewan. So thanks for joining us today. How, uh, how are you? I'm fine, Dan. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so Denise, uh, be, just because some of our audience may not be familiar with you and, and, and what you do, um, I'll ask t- for you to give uh, a brief you know, background on yourself, uh, where you've been, the types of stuff that you've done, and then we'll get to the, the topic of the day. Yeah, well, currently, as you mentioned, I'm assistant professor of monogastric nutrition here at the University of Saskatchewan. So my role involves both teaching and research in that position and both and teaching at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. And I'm involved in both poultry and swine nutrition. Uh, my background isn't in monogastric nutrition. I I did my undergrad here at the University of Saskatchewan, and I did what a lot of People did back, um, we're talking a few a while ago here, a few decades ago, did the traveling thing. And I spent a couple of years in West Africa and I came back and I was really lucky to get a job at a feed company. And I looked at the nutritionist of that, that feed company and I thought, oh, there's the job I want to have. So I went back to get my master's degree and that was here at the university with Dr. Dave Christensen, which um, some of your uh, followers may recognize that name. And that was in applied dairy science. And then I surprised myself by finding out that I really love the research. So I went to Ohio, the Ohio State University and worked with Dr. Don Palmquist in ruminant lipid metabolism and, and fat metabolism and got my PhD there and then on to a postdoc at the University of, of Illinois with Dr. Jim Drakeley. And then I just happened to uh, kind of, uh, for various reasons, wanted to return home to Saskatchewan. So I started at the Prairie Swan Centre as a research scientist working with Dr. John Patience. And it was not a bad learning curve. I think it's easier to go from ruminant to monogastric and you just kind of forget the rumen. And of course, working with somebody like like John Patience, uh, he taught me a lot. So I was really, really fortunate. So I've been here at the university now for only about six years. So it was was at at the Prairie Swan Centre, for almost twenty years, and then and then moved he, moved here to the U of S. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an interesting history. I think not one that a lot of people have of uh, switching species and 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 going back and forth. But um, I think definitely gives potentially a, a, a perspective that not, not a lot of people have when they're when they're focusing on the things and maybe not not as in in the silo as a lot of us academics uh, tend to uh, to be accused of. Um, so. We'll get to the, the 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 part that I think everybody's interested in, and and some of the the research and topics that you are that you've been interested in. And I know a lot of this is related to the increase in byproduct usage, or or the the, the focus on byproduct usage in in swine, and the 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 potential issues, and 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 I guess even more so the potential um, uh, benefits of, of using that. Um, so I. I, I guess we'll start with the the issues, <laughs> um, and that's mainly with mycotoxins. Uh, and I know you specifically got ergot, but I think a lot of the mycotoxins are definitely a problem with uh, the the byproducts. So, how about uh, just discuss some of the the work you've been that what you've been finding? Yeah, definitely. And I know Dan, you've also done some work in this area with Dawn, and we also did some work with Dawn or uh, uh, deoxin of alanol. And so, mycotoxins. Are we talk about them a little bit more when we're talking about co-product feeding because they tend to be concentrated when we're making um, flour or whatever from wheat or barley. Uh, the mycotoxins tend to be around the outside of the kernel, and so if we're using wheat mill run or something like that, or screenings, screenings can be really bad. Uh, they can be higher in mycotoxins than than the than the parent grain. Of course, we want to use these cold products. They're great. Uh, we can turn what is essentially a product with not much use into high quality 
pork uh, protein and, and do it at a relatively cheap cost. So we want to figure out how to use these. Um, there is some evidence that like every year, like we have some here in Western Canada, some years are good and very, very low levels of, of, of mycotoxins in our grains and some years very high depending upon the weather conditions. However, there's, there's evidence that the tendency is increasing, that whether it's changes in climate or maybe changes in uh, well, climate and growing conditions or perhaps um, growing crops further north where we didn't previously grow them, we are seeing chain, a general slow increase in, 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 in these mycotoxins. So we did some work, uh, we've been doing some work both in poultry and swine looking at ergot. And ergot is a really, really interesting, it's a group of compounds, it's from a fungus, the, the claviceps species, uh, develops like, like, like all mycotoxins or, or most mycotoxins in, in the field, uh, kind of depending upon the growing season, but cool and wet conditions are, are good for developing this, this fungus that we get the ergot comes from. Uh, ergot has a really, really interesting history. Uh, it's still used, the ergot alcohol, ergot alkaloids are used still in, 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 in human, for, in human um, as, as drugs for humans. We still use them somewhat. But if you go back in history, there's times like of mass hysteria, like the witches of Salem and that have been, it's, it's controversial, but perhaps attributed to ergot that people ingested ergot and it causes this hysteria. Um, so it's kind of fun to read about it. And there's even, I think, some short movies and short films and things about it. So, but it, uh, but the alkaloids still are used in, in, in human medicine, as I mentioned. Um, and I mentioned alkaloids. It's not a single compound. There's hundreds of ergot alkaloids. They're all common properties that they're alkaloids, but lots of differences uh, besides that. Um, we typically, when we do an analysis, uh, we analyze for six of them. So six different ergot alkaloids is what is what we typically analyze, is what was what we analyze for. The analysis that we do um, it requires HPLC tandem mass spec, so it's quite an involved analysis. If you're working for something like the Grain Commission or you're trading grain. What they actually do is they just count the the, the ergot bodies that that's uh, sclerotius. I don't know if you, can, you can cut that out, Dan. <laughs> they just count. I'll just say they just count the ergot bodies, and so depend for trading situations, it's just a percent of ergot. Unlike other mycotoxins, you can actually see the ergot bodies in the grain. So. By cleaning, uh, sorting, by density sorting, you can clean the grains to get rid of most of the ergot. However, if we're dealing with a co-product or screenings or something like that, then of course we, we can't see the ergot body because it's, it's probably been ground. So we work with the Prairie Diagnostics over here and they do our analysis for us. They, gave, they give us six different alkaloids and they also have recently um, refined their analysis analysis to give us the various epimers within those alkaloids. So each alkaloid is an R and an S epimer. And just change, and so that's just changes in the stereochemistry. It's like an isomer, but slightly different chemistry than, than an isomer. So very small changes to go from the R to the S S epimer. And there is some work, or very often you're I noticed when I was reading in reviews and, and, and in the literature that only the R epimer was toxic and the, the S epimer didn't seem to have any toxicity. And I also saw in the literature some evidence that processing, uh, pelleting, extrusion, anything involving heat and moisture decreased the R epimer and increased the S epimer. So the R to S ratio would decrease. So we got the idea, well, let's look at this. Let's see if we can decrease toxicity by processing. And if that is due to a change in the R to S ratio. So we did a, some uh, several trials. Our first experiment we did, we used, we, we really went 
uh, I thought if we're going to process, we're going to process like crazy. And we use steam explosion. So this was steam explosion of some heavily, heavily contaminated wheat screenings. And so steam explosion is almost like making popcorn. Yeah, the steam is injected and then, and it really, really is a dramatic process. And so doing this, yes, we dramatically decreased the R to S epimer ratio. We decreased the overall detectable ergot in the sample. And when we fed, when we fed these screenings to weanling pigs, in the first week only, we got a we got a decrease with the ergot alkaloid content in the diet if they had been processed. So so um, steam explosion did seem to decrease the the toxicity of these wheat screenings when they were fed to to to, to the winning piglets. And so we thought, well, this is great. The only issue is that steam explosion isn't really something that would probably not going to be practical, at least for a long time, for the feed industry. So we did a few, we decided to use some, the same idea, but some more modest um, processing that are more, more practical. So our next experiments were done with pelleting and extrusion. And with these, we targeted uh, zero to four parts per million of our ergot, total ergot alkaloids in our diets. And we did extrusion and we did pelleting. And we did see a modest shift in the R to S ratio, again, with pelleting and more so with extrusion. So our model worked where we did see a decrease in the R and an increase in the S. However, when we fed these diets to pigs in grow finish, we, since we did weaning pigs in the first experiment, we decided grow finish from 65 to 120 kilograms body weight, we, um, we fail to see an effect of processing on the performance of these pigs. So even though we changed the ratio and we decreased the R epimer, we didn't see an, an effect of that on, 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 on the growth of these pigs. So we, this was primarily in performance. And um, there was only at 4 ppm, only modest effects of the ergot alkaloids in general. We saw a modest decrease in feed intake in the first week that we gave them the test diets. So whether that's palatability or whether that's a direct effect, uh, we know the ergot alkaloids or some of them act on um, some of the, the brain re receptors that affect feed intake directly. Uh, it was really only in the first week that we saw that. And um, there was some modest effects on growth. But overall, in the 42-day trial, we didn't see any dramatic effects on performance of these pigs. And no, and, and as I mentioned, no, no effect of processing. Uh, the only major effect that we do see is a decrease uh, with the hormone um, prolactin. And we have done this in uh, an experiment that I did when I first started the swine center with John Patients. And this was in weanling pigs where we titrated the ergot in the diets and going very, very low in ergot. And in this experiment with, up, with 4 ppm ergot, dramatic decreases in the hormone prolactin with, with ergot in the diet. And here again, we did not see an effective processing. So regardless of processing, uh, we saw a dramatic decline with, with prolactin. So the practical implication of this is that um, we didn't see an overall effect of 4 ppm in the diet, regardless of processing on, on performance of the pigs and grow finish, but, but we did see a, a major effect on the hormone prolactin. And prolactin is really, really important in the sow for milk synthesis. So my advice to producers when they um, call me and say they suspect that maybe there's some ergot in their diets, number one, we always tell them to get it tested. And of course, that comes with all the other issues of testing for mycotoxin sampling and everything that um, that's, uh, that's always an issue with mycotoxins is the sampling aspects. But if they feel that they, they, they do want to buy this grain and use it, um, to not feed it to their sows, keep it out of their sow herd, because this effect on prolactin can cause a dramatic, there have been some studies done, some studies in Australia, 
a very quick, almost immediate cessation of milk output in the sows. And of course, we don't want that in our herds. Uh, depending on how long that would last, it would be reversible. If you took it out of the diet, if you, found, if you corrected it within a couple of days, you may be able to get, depending upon at what stage of lactation those sows are at. However, it's obviously not a good situation. Um, little information on what would happen if you if it got into the gestating sow's diet, but there again, I would I would I wouldn't take that chance. So the bottom line is, um, despite the fact that um, uh, we saw an effect on the R to S ratio, we we didn't see an effect of prostate. We didn't see that have an effect on toxicity. So. There has been some recent work done at Prairie Diagnostics, or I'm sorry, at, 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 the, at the Vet College, working through Prairie Diagnostics, the Vet College here at the U of S, Dr. Barry Blakely. And they're using purified ergot of the S epimers that they can buy in very small amounts, doing in vitro work, looking at um, uh, our, our, our arterial contractions or, or vasoconstriction. The main effect of ergot upon ingestion is it's, it's a vaso, it, it causes vasoconstriction. And so this in vitro work has shown that the S epimer does cause vasoconstriction, indicating that there is toxicity that that is caused by the S epimer as well. And it's a little bit of a cautionary tale because so I went and did a lot of digging in the library and I went back and back and back. And I finally had to get a librarian to help me to go back to some old conference proceedings to see where this idea of only one epimer being toxic comes from. And I found a one page summary from a German conference and it was in German. So then I, tra you know, Google translated it and it relates back to this one pager and he cites this as personal communications. And so that's where it is. It's a little embarrassing to, to say this, that I didn't do this to begin with. But that is where, because there'll still be articles being published talking about this, but that's the only evidence I can find for where this, this idea comes from. And the practical, another practical implication of this is if you're looking at like government regulations, um, um, how much ergot we can have in our feet, in our feeds, or if you're reading older papers, you don't really, well, you don't know if they're talking about two epimers or one epimer. Very often, because it, we only thought the R epimer was toxic, so that's the only one that was measured. So when the Canadian feed um, industry or the, the CFIA at the Canadian Feed Inspection Agency, Dan, you can get rid of that as well. So the CFIA, the Canadian Feed Inspection Agency, when they're talking 4 ppm, what I get from Prairie Diagnostics would be 8 ppm because I'm talking about two epimers there. And we think that the CFIA is only talking about one. And it's almost, I've seen very few, few papers that I've read where you can tell by going through their methods whether they're talking about one epimer or two. So that's kind of the practical aspect of this as well, is um, if both epimers are toxic, we need to be measuring both epimers. We need to have um, uh, te te techniques that measure that. And how do we relate this to what has been reported that may only be one epimer, but it's usually, it's usually not stated. It just, they just call it ergot or ergot alkaloids. So that's one of the practical implications of this. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. And obviously, like you said, it's a cautionary tale, but also it shows how something can make its way into dogma and, and people now just accept it and don't really understand where it came from or, or if it's actually even true. Well, like, I, and, and I've gone, I had to go back, you know, it's one of these things you had to go back with this person and then they cited this person and then they cited this person. So my only um, redeeming feature to myself is this, it wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of so I mean I'm not saying the data isn't out there but I have not been able to find it no but I I think it just highlights the fact that the, you know this is why we keep it, it seems like we keep going back and we re we re-research and we do it again and we do it again because you never you never know right uh you're gonna find out something like that and and specifically with that 
Um, I think it's interesting, and and maybe it's because of that your finding of you know no real evidence for this S versus R or epimer thing. Um, but what do you think? Because you got an effect of processing when you did the steam exploding, but not just the other one. I mean, it, most mycotoxins don't respond to the processing to begin with. But what you think it is with the steam exploding that that w- it was effective? I because it's steam explosion. It also decreased the total ergot amount. Um, it decreased the R more than the S, but also the total amount decreased. And so we, we added it to the diets based upon pre-processing. So steam exploded 4 ppm based upon, and then we analyzed it. We didn't get near the amounts. So steam explosion, I think it just, it's, it's such a violent reaction. It's able to disrupt the, the, the compound as well, perhaps even. So it's, it's, it's that drastic of a reaction. Um, the the material you get out of, out of the steam exploder it it doesn't even look like what went in like it's not a pellet or an extrusion it's it's a it's almost a it's almost like a solid goo it 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 it's it, it's not you know so steam explosion would be good for probably not good for something like 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 a feeding you know what you know, like, like, to, like, to, like to, to make a feed ingredient, but it was a good start for us because it's such a drastic, it would be good for, for other, um, maybe if you're, I'm not sure what happened if you're steam exploding whole grains, then I said like, it, they might look like popcorn, but this was steam exploding screenings. So they, they really, really didn't, it was, it was a, it, very difficult to work with in terms of taking that and going back into our, into our diets, but it, it was used as our model for ex, extreme very extreme. Yeah. Well, and at least it tells you that there is some level of processing out there that will have an effect. So we just said, what is that? And then what is something that can be used in the industry practically? Yeah. Um, I think, so I think we'll move to the, the, the second part of your work. And then this, this, I find interesting. And I think it's, it's, it's timely in that, um, you know, this has been a major discussion uh, and, and a major focus, even of the, of the most recent cluster funding with this, uh, climate change and greenhouse gases specifically, and I know I, again you've done work on on uh, the use of byproducts or or co-products, and and if we can use them to potentially decrease some sort of greenhouse gas production in pigs. So, um, how about we just uh, talk about that for for a while? Yeah, this was done a few years ago, and I had a couple of students working in this area, and my um, the starting point for this was. I know they're developing feed or ingredient tables and trying to put some element of, of the carbon footprint from that ingredient in the table that we could use in our feed formulation. And when I was in the initial discussions of this, they were, while well, working with, it was primarily American data that they were using to go into these tables. So my idea was, well, what about, you know, here in Western Canada, how does that fit here? And my other concern was using byproducts or co-products, typically they are higher in fiber. You know, m- most of them were feeding a lot more fiber to our pig. And would any benefit from feeding a co-product be offset perhaps by enteric production, fermentation, and increased greenhouse production from the, the pig or the especially like a larger pig, like a sow or something itself. And our hypothesis was we didn't think it would, but we wanted to test this so that these would have some numbers to go into these tables and using, if we want to use, for example, carbon footprint as part of our feed formulation. So that was uh, what we started with. Our, our, our hypothesis was that we could feed these coal products and not see an increase in greenhouse gas output. And therefore, any benefits from using coal products, where essentially what you're doing is any um, any of the carbon, for example, that's used to grow that grain, the inputs, uh, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. So there is a carbon footprint of growing that grain. Uh, I recognize there's also benefits. There's um, uh, sequestration in the soil, improvements in the soil, whatever, but the overall benefits, if we use a co-product, any of those carbon inputs, we're, um, we're taking some of that and we're using, you know, we're making, we're make, anything we can do to make more use of the grain 
kind of uh, dilutes out the carbon inputs that was used to, to, to grow that, if that makes sense. So we took we took advantage of the Prairie Swan Center. Um, the uh, we've got some chambers out there that can measure gas output um, quite uh, precisely. Uh, we used uh, these chambers. We can put like five pigs per chamber, and so this would be the greenhouse gas output from the pigs and from the manure at the same time. And uh, doing these experiments. So what, what we do then is we try, we get the baseline in the chambers down to as close to zero as we can. The air coming in is all filtered and, and that, and the chambers are lined, lined with, with, um, with um, st stainless steel. So the gas doesn't stick to the walls or anything. And then we measure a lot of measurements with air movements and coming and going so that we can adjust the old, we can measure greenhouse gas accumulation over time. And then we bring gas samples actually here to, 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 to the U of S and measure the gas in them using gas chromatography. And, and we were not able to, going up to 15% um, uh, wheat screenings in the diets, or, or I'm sorry, 15 or 30% wheat screenings in the diets, or 15 or 30% peas, uh, we could not measure an increase in greenhouse gas or any of the greenhouse gases from these pigs. Uh, we, were, we were looking at peas as well because peas would have the extra benefit of nit nitrogen fixation in the soil. So, but they also have a different fiber characteristic. Uh, greenhouse gases, it was extremely variable, day to day, pig to pig, treatment to treatment. But overall, um, the enteric output, uh, what, what we, we, couldn't, we could not measure an increase. So we can be confident that we can use these pigs, we can use these byproducts and any of the benefits from using the byproducts, so taking, taking the carbon that's being used to grow that grain and spreading it out over, you know, over d different uses, um, we can do that without having the cost of increased enteric production from the pig. The only uh, one caveat, what we did see was increased manure output from these pigs, the overall quantity of manure, as one would expect with increased fiber. And that wasn't included in our models. So we didn't model the increased manure output and the cost of, putting that, of spreading that onto the land. But of course, because that manure could replace, dependent upon how it's used on the land, it could replace inorganic sources of fertilizer. Um, it, it's quite a complicated model and it, it can be a benefit or a, or a detriment, dependent depend upon on the model that you used. But that is one thing that I have to say, we, we, and we did not include that in our model. But overall, um, and certainly um, this has been shown by, by others in terms, in, especially in just basic modeling experiments, that use, using these co-products will decrease the carbon footprint of pork production. And certainly um, pork production I mean, is not known to be a high carbon footprint protein to begin with. So this makes, makes, make, makes it even better. So it's kind of a win-win situation. They're low cost and something that we can use and improve the environmental sustainability of, of pork production. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a good news story for for pig. You know, even though we we are low to begin with, so it's not really. I I, I think a lot of the the climate change discussion has not really surrounded us. Uh, luckily, I made mean, it to some to some extent, but I think. You know, it's also showing the benefit of something that we're already doing by incorporating a lot of these byproducts that would normally go to waste or or, or something else, and and making a good quality product out of it. So. Well, and in terms of um, if we ever, you know, in terms of carbon pricing, carbon credits, we will want to know what the carbon, you know, when we're formulating a diet that could become an important component, and we're at least costing the diet uh, the carbon. Uh, you know, how much of the carbon footprint of those ingredients could certainly c come into play. And so I wanted, so that was one of my main reason of doing this was to have, you know, some good, some data from Western Canada that we can use in, use in formulations. Yeah. I guess other than that specific data that, that you're talking about, when you were working with these models, was there information that seems to be like lacking as maybe even more so for pigs that, you know, we, we should focus on and, and maybe need to improve this? Yeah, um, I was working with the Ag Canada modders down in Lethbridge. So this is the HOLOS model, H-O-L-O-S. And that model had been developed for beef production 
Okay. So working with them, we, um, so I worked with them to use this model for pork production. So it was, a, it was our first run through of using this for, for hog farming. So we have done a lot of works, not we, um, they have done a lot of work on the model since then, getting a, a specific um, component in the model for, for pork production. Before that, we were just, we were using the, the beef unit and using their, and putting in the new equations and things as we went along and using it for pork production. So it's been drastically improved and built upon since, since I was using it. Um, so I, and we were just doing the modeling as kind of another part of this experiment to help them and add value or add um, some data for their modeling. I mean, my main part, my main part was to get data to go into the models. But I know now certainly there are several models since then that have been developed and are being used for pork production. And certainly there's some in Europe and there's also a couple I know people in Quebec and Ontario that have developed uh, separate models. And I don't know enough about them, but some of them are, I think, quite a bit more involved than the Holus model perhaps. But the Holus model has been developed uh, so this is the ICANDA model to be user friendly. So I think to do that, you have perhaps take out some of the complexity, but it, it's it, 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 it's free online for anybody to use. They have lots of workshops or they have a couple of workshops every year to help people use them. So it's it's been developed to be to be more quite user friendly. So and that that's another advantage for me using it. I use it in my teaching. So I show the students some of the aspects of what goes into a greenhouse gas model. And they're always quite, you know, when I say it's user friendly, not as complex, there still are a lot of equations in the background. And they're always quite amazed at how much detail there is. So it, it's really informative for them to, to, to see what to see what's involved in these models. But it, but it was developed primarily for beef. So in, the, in Alberta, of course, a lot of work being done with with the beef industry and, and greenhouse gas output. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it develops and obviously, you know, probably be a very good tool in the future for, you know, that we will have to incorporate into, into feed formulation or production. I, this person's not going anywhere, right? So No, and I know there are some people out there currently working and are putting similar, the same data in the various models and seeing how they compare, they come out with the same uh, conclusions. But each model, I think the most important thing is to define your boundaries. So when we were doing our work, like I say, we didn't go out to spreading the manure on the land, but we did incorporate growing that grain. And so to do that, we would have to, we picked a specific soil zone, soil zone in Saskatchewan, for example. So the rainfall, the climate data, that was all in the model. Uh, the average fer fertilizer inputs and all of that was in the model. So the, all the agronomic characteristics for that soil zone were in the model. So we could model the carbon footprint of growing that grain, bringing it into the barn, putting it into our diets. And then we stopped at uh, where that pig would leave the barn. So we stopped, we, we didn't uh, model take, taking that pig to market. We, we stopped at the barn, barn door. So that's very, you know, important that when we're comparing these models, we're using the same, the, the very same boundaries to, to, to give us a comparison. Yeah. No. Because it's very interesting, and we'll we'll have to wait and see where it all, where it all goes. Yeah, and like I say, and and I'm not a modeler, but I, I was using their model and helping them with the data, or not, or using, and they were using some of this data to help refine their models. And really, it's it's really different. It's it, it's fun. I played around with it a little bit, but it, it's like not enough to to really to really get into it so far. It's great yeah. for teaching. I really like it for teaching. It really gets the students. You know, because a lot of the students like playing with something on their computers and it really, it's something for them to play with. Turn it into an iPad app and then everybody will be on carbon footprinting. <laughs> the Nutrition Athena, Shakespeare Mill, Farmhouse and Nutrition Partners Nutrition Group offer the full range of nutritional product based on extensive research and developments and a solid team of experts all across Canada. Our objective is to provide cost-effective solutions, innovation, and support to producer from the entire Canadian swine industry. Uh, we're getting close to the to the end of our time, so uh, 
I guess uh, one I, one thing I ask everybody is if there's say one or one or two messages that you hope that the listeners uh, get from 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 this episode. What would that be? Well, I think that um, in terms of the science and the research, uh, the research we're doing on using co-products and byproducts, in my mind, that is where in terms of swine industry and feeding our pigs, I think we're going to be heading more and more in that direction. And certainly um, the high feed price, when feed prices get as high as they are right now, we often see that more more and more. But even I think if feed prices come down even a bit, I don't, I, I, I think we're, we're there to stay of using these coal products and byproducts. And it's a great way we can turn them into a really, really high quality protein. And in my mind, that's kind of the role. That's kind of our role as livestock and protein producers is to take a low quality protein and turn it into a really, really high quality protein. And so if we can figure out how to do that. It's, to me, that's that 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 that's a win-win. Well, and do that, and and with the extra benefits, right, of using used before, and then lowering greenhouse gases or something. You know, I, I now I think that's great. Um, okay, so now is the time we we switch to a little bit uh, different <laughs> uh, types of questions, and we ask the same three questions of everybody. And the first one uh, is, what is your favorite swine-related book or resource? I go back to Dr. Chantal Farmers, and I know you've talked to her on on your on your broadcast as well, Dan. But her books on lact on the lactating sow and the more recent one on the gestating and lactating sow. Um, number one, there's not a lot out there on them, so it's really really great to get some new information. And they are just, I hate I, I don't know what this says about me, but I I, I read them for fun even. Uh, they're they're really nice. I really, you know, I, 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 you know, it's it's a, it's a it, they're they're very good reads. Chantal will like that more <laughs> more consumption of her books. <laughs> um, so I guess that sort of leads us to the next question, but you can't say the same thing for this one. <laughs> so then, what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? Oh, my favorite book or resource outside of you mean books to read or what I go to for information. Your go-to for information. What do you read for fun? Like, except for the suckling pig or wrong. Yeah, just, for yeah. fun, I do. Um, I really like um, historical fiction. I'll put a plug in for my sister-in-law. Has a new book came out last month called Heartstones. If anybody wants to look that up, the author is Christine Nick Nikoluk. And it's the story of her Ukrainian grandparents coming here to, to Canada back in the early 1900s. And I just got a copy of it last, just managed to get a copy of it last week, so I haven't read it, but it's gotten very, very good reviews. I also, um, the last book I finished that I really enjoyed, it's a book I've got actually sitting here on my desk. It's called Owl by Desmond Morris. So it is actually nonfiction, and it's it's the um, sociological and scientific, um, historical, everything you ever want to know about owls. And it's very, very well written. Um, I'm a bird watcher from way, way, way back. And it, it, it also, it's, for, it, it's like I said, it's nonfiction, but it's, it's a kind of like the sociological history of owls and their place in society. It's, it's, it's super, it was, it was a very, very good read as well. That does sound interesting. I guess we'll remind our, our listeners that Denise does not get any royalties out of the books that she's promoting <laughs> on these. So, um, <laughs> okay. My sister-in-law is uh, a very good baker as well. So that helps. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, she could pay you in muffins or something. <laughs> um, so our final question is, in your opinion, uh, what sets successful swine professionals apart from those who are not? Oh, yes. Curiosity, uh, flexibility. Uh, you have to be willing to, to, to change because uh, things are changing. So I, I, would go, I would go with those two. Be curious. Why is happening to, you know, we, we can see what's happening, question why it's happening. And then and and be flexible. Um, the world is a changing place, and we kind of have to almost enjoy flexibility as a challenge. 
And I know that's, that's a little bit more difficult if you are something like a farm manager and you've got a barn that is, is sitting there and you don't have, it's, it's easier for me to perhaps do that when I just have a desk and I'm sitting here at the university. But I, from what I see around me and the people I work with and the I, people I've been privileged to work with in my career, those are a couple of things I've noticed, certainly. And, 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 and you have to enjoy it. I agree. <laughs> I think it's, it's like, like you said, it's easy for us to sit here behind the desk and say, oh, yeah, you should be doing this. But, you know, what, what does that mean at, at the production level? But yeah, obviously being willing to, to change and accept that it is, is, it is, is clearly something very important. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I think that brings us to the end. So uh, I hope, hope you enjoyed your, your time and thank you very much for participating in, in this and, uh, maybe we'll have you on in, in again in the future. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank you.